Okay, let's open our Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As you can see on the screen behind me, today will be part 5 of what I think is going to actually extend out to a 7-part series in our main text, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, as we continue to discuss the return of the Lord. Let's read our text, starting in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is our Lord's authoritative, inspired, trustworthy word of truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. Okay. Well, again, uh, today is part five of, like I said, we'll probably be about a seven-part series, The Return of the Lord. And once we conclude this section, The Return of the Lord, then we'll go into chapter five and we will start to discuss the day of the Lord. And so that's why I want to spend a lot of time here in this section so that we get a nice foundation so that when we go into the day of the Lord, um, we understand what Paul is saying here. We also understand the various different views on that. And so again, that's why I want to go rather uh, uh, slow here, slowly through this, okay? Now, uh, we know our context. The Apostle Paul uh, had planted this church in Thessalonica, northern part of Greece in the area of Macedonia. He, eventually, he got kicked out of there, eventually ended up down in the southern part of Greece in Corinth. And it was there that Paul received great news about that young church up in Thessalonica. Timothy, who had been up there, came down to Corinth and he met with Paul and he reported to Paul, hey, the church is doing well. Yes, they're being persecuted. But nevertheless, these young believers are standing firm in the faith. The church is bringing glory to Christ. And so Paul was so excited when he heard this news. I mean, remember, I mean, back then, uh, you know, he, he didn't know what happened. After he had been kicked out of Thessalonica and eventually ended up down in Corinth, Paul had no idea what was going on up there, right? Was the church still there? I mean, were those young believers to whom he had ministered with whom he had ministered to, were they truly regenerated? Uh, well, you know, were they standing firm in the faith, uh, or did they just fold when they were being persecuted? And again, back then, no internet, <laughs> no emails, no text, no FaceTime. Paul had no idea to know. He didn't know what was going on with them. And again, that's why he had sent Timothy up there to check on them. When Timothy returned and met with Paul in Corinth, Paul was blown away. He was so thankful to God for God's grace in protecting, providing for that church and those believers up in Thessalonica. And again, as we know, uh, really the first three chapters, Paul was, uh, you know, thanking God for the Thessalonian believers. He was explaining to the Thessalonian believers why he was not able to return to them so quickly. Um, he also explained to them and defended himself uh, against false accusations from the people who, you know, the mob who had chased Paul out of town. Uh, and the mob now turned their sights on these young Thessalonian believers. And not only were they persecuting the Thessalonians, they were also making up all kinds of lies against Paul. And so Paul defended himself against those lies in this letter. Uh, 
Paul also talked about how he was eager to eventually come back and see the Thessalonian believers. He prayed for the Thessalonian believers. Chapter 4, he, he, he encouraged them to continue to excel still more in uh, you know, trying to please God, in their purity before God and others, um, in their brotherly love, in their daily work uh, to honor the Lord. And then here in this section, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, Paul addressed um, some questions, some concerns that the young Thessalonian believers had regarding the return of the Lord. Again, we know the context. Christians were dying in that church. And Christ hadn't yet returned. And so naturally, they, they had some questions. They were confused. And one of the big things was, okay, our loved ones who died in the Lord. Christ hasn't come back yet. But when he comes back, is he also going to, you know, do something with those who died in the Lord, or are they just kind of forgotten? And so, and then, obviously, they had a question, okay, if we're still alive and Christ comes back, what happens to us as well? And so, here in this section, Paul addresses these questions and concerns. And he starts out, if you recall, we saw this last week, he starts out verses 13 through 15, reassuring them that their dead loved ones who died in the Lord, believers who died, that Christ won't forget them when he comes back. Here's the reassurance. Starting in verse 13, he says, We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Who are those? Koimeo is the Greek word. Who are asleep? He's talking about those who died in the Lord. How do we know that? Just hop over to the end of verse 16. He describes them. The dead in Christ. Believers who died. Back to verse 13. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those who died in Christ, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Uh, Paul was here reassuring these believers, listen, yes, it's okay to grieve that your loved ones have died, but don't grieve like the pagans do who have no clue about eternal life, no clue about a Savior. You don't grieve, Christian, like those who have no hope. It's okay to grieve. But we know that this life is not the end, right? And Paul goes on to say, verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which we do, well then guess what God is going to do with those who died in Christ? They're going to rise again, right? He says, even so, God will bring with him, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Again, we know, as we saw a couple weeks ago, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, Philippians 1, that Paul had stated to be away from this body is to be at home with the Lord, right? Again, when a believer dies, their body is separated from their soul or spirit, right? And so their earthly body just remains here, okay? It's a body that's perishable. It's a body that will never you know, live throughout eternity. That's why, as we're going to see in a few moments, and we studied last week, we're going to get imperishable bodies, new glorified bodies, right? But before that occurs, a believer dies here on earth, and their body, you know, their perishable body stays here. But their soul or spirit immediately goes home to be with the Lord, and their soul and spirit is conscious, right? And Paul says here, when Christ comes back, those whose who souls are home with the Lord will return with the Lord. Okay? Well, what's going to happen? Verse 15, Paul says, We say this by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Something is going to happen with the bodies of those who have died in the Lord. 
their glorified souls are coming back with the Lord. And Paul says, if we're still alive when that happens, they who have died in the Lord will precede us in something. What is that? Well, Paul starts to describe it. Verse 16, part A, he gives us more information about the return of Christ. He says, the Lord himself will descend. Christ's return will be personal. It will be visible, not just locally, globally, universally. And it will be glorious. The Lord himself will return. And he will descend from heaven with a shout, with a powerful command. With the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And second part of it, verse 16. Now we know what happens to those who died in the Lord. The resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise, be resurrected first. They will get new glorified bodies that will connect to their glorified souls and they will be with the Lord. If this happens today, we who are still alive will not perceive them in this order. They first are raised to be with the Lord, right? Well, then what happens to us? Verse 17, the rapture. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Caught up, uh, Latin word rapturos, where we get our English word rapture. The Greek word is harpazo. It literally means like a snatching. It's almost like a violent uh, pulling away. So what ends up happening is, when Christ returns, the souls of those who have died in the Lord, who are now in heaven with the Lord, fully conscious, the souls of those who died in the Lord will return back with the Lord, right? And with a shout, Christ's command, their dead bodies will be resurrected. But in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, they will get new, imperishable, glorified bodies that will connect to their glorified souls. They're with the Lord in the air. Then what happens to us is we're still alive. Well, we get raptured, harpazo, taken out, caught up with them. And so we will also get new glorified bodies and souls immediately, right? And we read, we'll be caught up together with them, those who had died in the Lord, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And the next R, end of verse 17, there's a reunion. Those who had died in the Lord, fully glorified bodies, fully glorified souls. We, if we're still alive when the Lord returns, we're harpazoed up, raptured up, receive new glorified bodies and souls, and here's the reunion. We, those who are dead in the Lord, who have been resurrected by the Lord. We, those who are still alive, raptured by the Lord, will always be with the Lord. Do you see the reunion? Praise God, right? And that's why Paul said in verse 18, we have a responsibility as Christians when it comes to this phenomenal news. Christ isn't leaving behind those who died in the Lord. He's not forgetting them. They're not going to be treated as second-class citizens. They're going to be resurrected first. Then we'll be raptured up if we're still alive. That's why Paul said our responsibility, verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. As Christians, we don't grieve over the loss or the death of the loved ones who died in the Lord. We don't grieve like those who have no hope. Why? Because Scripture tells us what's going to happen when Christ returns. Right? To them and to us. 
And so our grieving is, is a grieving that we miss our loved ones. But we know that there's going to be a glorious reunion, right? We know that those who died in the Lord will be raised up by the Lord. Then we will be caught up and brought up to the Lord, right? And we will be together with the Lord forever. Therefore, talk about comfort. And talk about how you can comfort others, especially those who have lost loved ones recently. You pull out this text and you say, man, I, I know you're struggling. I know, I know you're maybe wondering what's happening and, and it's hard, but let me, let me just offer you some words of comfort here in this text. I think I shared this with you guys a couple of weeks ago. This is the very text I taught at the memorial service of my father 10 years ago. You know, everybody was grieving, especially my mother, my wife, and others. And so wait a second, it's okay to grieve. But we don't want to grieve as those who have no hope. Why? I opened up this text and I taught it. And boy, I tell you, it's a son, especially having to minister the, the memorial service. Why? Looking at my father's body in that casket. Tough on one hand, but on the other hand, I was like, whoa, that's not my father. His soul's with the Lord. This is his body I'm looking at. It's a perishable body. That's not what he's going to have throughout eternity. He's going to get a new imperishable glorified body. How do we know this? If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, right? Even so, we know God will do the same with us, his people who are in Christ, right? Talk about comfort. Talk about joy, and boy, talk about a great excuse for me to continue to eat peanut M&Ms. <laughs> I'm getting a new body, right? I don't have to worry about my weight. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Well, I want to kind of like uh, transition now and um, uh, follow up on what I introduced to you guys last time um, about two... Um, major views that differ regarding the rapture, okay? And today we'll go a little deeper, and then next time and probably a time after that, we'll go even deeper. I'm going to try to put this together for you, but do it slowly, right? Now, as we saw last week, there are two, um, well, there are <laughs> numerous different views <laughs> regarding the rapture, but I'm going to just talk about what I believe are the two main views. One view is called dispensationalism, dispensational theology. The other view is called covenant theology. Now, Dispensational theology, and again, I'm generalizing here because there are many subgroups within dispensationalism, so I'm just going to generalize, but I want to throw out a disclaimer. If there's any, somebody who is a dispensationalist listening to this, they're going to say, wait a second, that's not what... I'm just generalizing here, okay? <laughs> um, dispensational theology, uh, let, let's, let's put it this way. Their eschatology study of end times comes out of their ecclesiology, their belief about the church. What do I mean by that? Dispensational theology teaches that God works with Israel separate from God working with the church. In other words, they say that God works with Israel in different dispensations, time periods, and he works with the church in different dispensations and time periods, okay? For instance, uh, they'll say that from the Old Testament up until Pentecost, Pentecost, 
That was the dispensation of Israel. God was working with Israel. They will then say from Pentecost until the rapture. They say that God is working with the church. Well, wait a second. Does that mean God forgot Israel? No, no, no. The next dispensation. They say God is working with Israel. But first, they say, God raptures out the church, the church believers from the dispensation from Pentecost to the rapture. They say that believers are caught up, taken out by Christ. They're in heaven. And then God starts his dispensation again with Israel. A dispensation, they say, starts with, after we're raptured out, starts with what is called the seven-year tribulation, where the Antichrist reveals himself. Some groups within dispensationalism will say the first three and a half years of that seven-year tribulation, uh, he is deceiving everybody, getting everybody to believe in him and follow him, that he's a great leader. And then the last three and a half years, he really reveals who he is. And there's just tremendous tri uh, tribulation. They say that Israel will go through that. But during that period, God will be saving people, the Jews, right? Well, after that tribulation, they say Christ comes, or actually Christ comes to end that tribulation they call that his second coming. What we're reading here in verses 13 through 18, they say does not refer to his second coming. Why? Look over in verse 17. They say that Christ doesn't actually come back to this earth. They say that he is up in the air brings those who are dead in Christ to him, those who died during the church age, also then raptures up the church, those who are still alive, and we meet the Lord in the air. They say that tells you that's not his second coming because he never actually came back to the earth. They say that his second coming occurs at the end of the seven-year tribulation where Christ comes back to judge, he actually comes back, we come back also, and he sets up what is called his 1,000-year millennial reign, where Christ literally reigns in Jerusalem on the throne of David, and it will be then that God continues to gather in the Jews. National Israel will once again reach its zenith in power, uh, Jews will be saved during that seven-year tribulation and thousand-year millennial reign. And then at the end of that, Christ will destroy Satan, judge, you know, all that, and usher in the eternal state. Again, I'm generalizing here, but I'm just giving you the idea of what dispensationalism is. And chances are many of you were actually taught this view on the rapture. Okay? Covenant theology says that, no, no, no. God's not working with Israel one time and in the church and this, that, and the other. No, the covenant theology says that God is working with his chosen people, Jews and Gentiles, and that God is saving them. And that the period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, they say, covenant theologians, that that entire period is a period of tribulation where tribulation gets worse and worse and worse. They don't hold to a literal seven-year tribulation. They just say the whole period between the first and second coming of Christ is tribulation. And again, it'll get worse and worse as we get closer and closer to the coming of Christ. They also say that Christ's rule, millennial rule, is symbolic, that there's not a literal thousand years, 
But they, rather, they, that, that's just symbolic for Christ's rule between his first and second coming, where he is ruling spiritually on the throne of the hearts of the elect. And so, to just summarize this, and to, now I'm going to show you some scriptures, to summarize this, dispensational theology, we're just going to focus on this part today, says that God works with really two people groups, Israel and the church, in different dispensations. Where covenant theology says, no, God works with just his people, his chosen, and uh, there aren't different dispensations. Make sense? Now, where do dispensationalists get this idea that God works with Israel and the church, and where do they get this idea of the church being raptured out early and seven-year tribulation? Well, let me just show you one of the main texts they use. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Let's see if I can make this simple, <laughs> because it can get confusing. Daniel chapter 9. Verses 24 through 27. Now, Daniel, a Jewish man who had been taken into exile into Babylon during the first wave taken into exile around 605 BC, God gave Daniel a vision, a vision of the coming Messiah. How do we know that? Just look at uh, middle verse 25. He talks about when the Messiah, the Prince, will come. Okay? So Daniel's writing somewhere, and we're just, let me just estimate here, or approximate, somewhere around 500 ish BC. And God is now showing Daniel in a vision that approximately, you know, 483, 490 years later from when Daniel had this vision, God is showing Daniel what's going to happen with the Messiah. Let's read. Verse 24, 70 weeks, uh, some translations say 77s, to make it simple, 490 years. 490 years have been decreed for your people, underline your people, and your holy city, underline your holy city. Well, Daniel is a Jew. So when God says 490 years, something's going to happen in 490 years from this vision for your people. Who was Daniel's people? The Jews. And for your city, which city? Jerusalem. Okay? Well, what's going to happen in 490 years-ish? Well, there's going to be the end of transgression. An end of sin. Someone's coming to make atonement for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Who's that someone? Who... Atoned for iniquity. Who took care of our sin transgression problem. The Messiah. So you see, Daniel is getting this vision of the coming Messiah. Verse 25. You're to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So you had Persian King Cyrus who had made that proclamation, allowing the first wave to leave the exile. You also had King Artaxerxes later, allowing Ezra to go back, and then eventually Nehemiah. So again, we don't know the exact date here, but we're just approximating here. From that period, okay, somewhere from 538 B.C. to 445 B.C., from the issuing of the decree to restore Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... There'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks, 483 years, which works out almost exactly to when Christ came. So this whole thing so far, verse 24 and 25, verses 24 and 25, have to do with the coming of the Messiah, who will make atonement for sin and, trans, and trans, end transgression and so forth, right? So, Daniel, this is approximately when he's coming. Verse 26, after 62 weeks, plus the seven, 483 years from when Daniel got the vision, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. What is that talking about? His crucifixion. 
And then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come like a flood. Even if there will be the end of war, desolations are determined. Who's the people of the prince? It's not the Messiah who's going to bring destruction to Jerusalem. Some dispensations say that refers to the Antichrist. But wait a moment. After Christ had put, who had made atonement for sin, after he had been cut off, resurrected, 40 days later he ascended to heaven, 30 some years later, what happened to the city of Jerusalem? It was destroyed. By whom? The Romans. So, Covenant theologians say that the people of the prince here, it's not the Antichrist, it's referring to what Titus would end up doing when he came in like a flood destroying Jerusalem, the temple, and so many Jews as well. Verse 27. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week. The covenant theologians say that the he that's being referred to here is the Messiah. He'll make a firm covenant with the chosen people. And then Jesus say, um, you know, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. He will make a covenant, the Messiah, with his people during that time through his atoning sacrifice. Dispensational theologians say this refers to the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. And this is where they get this idea of the rapture. They say, or the seven-year tribulation, they say, verse 27, that he, the Antichrist, makes a firm covenant with many for one week. Seven years. In the middle of that week, three and a half years. He puts a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Now they say during that seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist reveals himself halfway through who he really is, and he stops the Jews from sacrificing at the temple, which means dispensationalists teach that the temple will be rebuilt and the Jews will start to reinstitute the sacrificial system. Now they will say, not a sacrificial system to try to pay for sins. They will say it's like a memorial to what Christ has done. Covenant theologians say verse 27 refers to Jesus Christ, who made a covenant for the elect with the elect through his once for all time uh, 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 um, uh, sacrifice. And he did that during the period when he came. He's the one who put an end to grain offerings and sacrifices. And therefore, there's no need for a new temple and a new sacrificial system. Do you see the difference? And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Um, again, dispensationalists say that refers to the Antichrist. It could. But the point of Daniel 9 is this. Dispensational theologians say that this is decreed, watch, for Israel. Again, look up at verse 24. Daniel, for you and your people. What is decreed? The Messiah is going to come. Great. But then they say the Antichrist is going to eventually come. He's going to come during that seven period, seven year period. He is going to deceive many the first three and a half years. He's then going to bring all kinds of tribulation the last three and a half years, attack the Jews. And dispensational theologians say because God works with Israel in one dispensation, the church in the other dispensation, that's why they say this seven-year tribulation that they say Daniel's referring to happens after what we're studying in 1 Thessalonians 4 that the church is raptured out. 
So the church, they say, will never experience this tribulation. They say Israel will. Why? Because again, they say God doesn't work with Israel and the church during the same dispensation. And they say, again, verse 24, that God was saying this is for your people, Daniel, Jews, and your city, Jerusalem. But again, verse 27, to say that the he in verse 27 is the Antichrist? When the preceding verses are referring to Jesus Christ? I don't know. Again, you know, to say that the Antichrist, verse 27, for one week, the seven, supposed seven-year period, he's going to put an end to sacrifice and grain offering. Why don't you say that's Jesus Christ who did put an end to sacrifice and grain offering through his once-for-all-time sacrifice, right? So you see where this can get confusing? In fact, go over to chapter 12. Again, the Jews will say, or the uh, uh, dispensational theologian will say, again, God works with Israel, uh, separate from the church. Again, chapter 12, referring to the end times. Uh, again, God is speaking to Daniel and through Daniel. Uh, now at the end, and now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, Daniel, Michael, angel in heaven, that I guess is a special guardian for Israel, he'll arise. And there will be a time of distress, as they say, the th this positional theologian that refers to the seven-year tribulation from Daniel 9. They say this is talking about it. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, resurrection, some to everlasting life, others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So, let me just summarize. Dispensational theology. God works with Israel in the church during different dispensations. They say from the Old Testament to Pentecost was the dispensation of Israel. From Pentecost to the rapture, proceeding what they say is the seven-year tribulation that they find, they say in Daniel 9, they say the church will be raptured out. But that period from Pentecost to the rapture is called the church age. God's working with the church. God's working with the church. God's working with the church. Church gets raptured out. Now you start the seven-year tribulation that ends in seven years. Israel, Israel, Israel goes through the tribulation. God will save, as we see here in Daniel 12, they say. God will rescue, save. Then Christ comes back, second coming, because they say what we refer to in 1 Thessalonians is not his second coming, because he was just in the air. He never touched his feet on the ground. And they say he'll then set up his thousand-year millennial reign. Again, focusing on Israel. And then at the end of that, after judging Satan and Antichrist and so forth, he will then usher in the eternal kingdom. Dispensational theology. Where do they get this from? Well, some of their premier texts for their theology, we just studied. Daniel 9, Daniel 12. Again, In Daniel 9, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. God said was going to come, make atonement for sin, put an end to transgression. I think also make a covenant. Put an end to grain offering and all sacrifices. I think if you just logically follow the text, I think that's fair to say you can land there. We're talking about the Messiah. But dispensations will say, no, no, no. Yes, we're talking about the Messiah. Then there is a transition talking about the Antichrist. And again, I'll talk more about this next week. That's where they get their idea of God working with Israel, church, different dispensations. But it's interesting. Covenant theologians say, wait a second. 
Christ is working with his people, Jews and Gentiles. What do you mean? John 10, I think we, re, we, we took a look at this last week, but let me add a couple more here. John chapter 10, starting in verse 14, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. In this context, Jesus was in Israel talking primarily to which group of people? The Jews. Right? But then look what our Lord says. Verse 16, I have other sheep. Who's he referring to there? The Gentiles, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also to salvation. They'll hear my voice. They will become one flock and have one shepherd. So covenant theologians say from the time of Christ's first coming to his second coming, Christ is gathering his one flock comprised of Jews and Gentiles. Now, yes, Romans 11, there's been a partial hardening, hardening of the Jews till the fullness of the Gentiles come in. But it's not like the Lord's going to forget the Jews. He's got his elect. And so from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ, this whole period is where our Lord is gathering his one flock. And we are going to go through tribulation. In fact, I just, I just saw a report, I think it was yesterday, one out of every nine Christians in this world are experiencing severe persecution right now. Now, again, here in the United States, we, we don't see that so much. But interestingly, it's getting worse, isn't it? Um, people throughout the, Christians throughout the world are experiencing per persecution. And so this idea to say, well, Christians aren't going to go through tribulation because we're supposedly going to get raptured out prior to that. I don't know. You know, explain to me. The early church fathers who were, you know, killed for their faith. The apostles, um, the great reformers, the Puritans, people throughout church history, men and women, burned at the stake. You know, uh, wild animals sicked on them. Jesus says, one flock, one shepherd. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Again, look what the Apostle Paul says, talking to the Christians in Galatia, primarily made up of Gentiles, but there were Jews there. He says, you're all, verse 26, sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, and you've clothed yourself with Christ, the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, uh, free man, neither male nor female. Why, Paul? You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, regardless of you're Jew or Gentile, then you're Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. See what Scripture says here? Again, Daniel 9, Daniel 12, you can kind of go, okay, it kind of looks like God's working with Israel and one dispensation and church and another. Okay, I see where they dispensations get that. But then you look what Jesus said, what Paul says. In fact, just go to chapter 6. Paul makes another point about this. Uh, verses 15 and 16, he says, For neither circumcision is anything nor uncircumcision in terms of salvation. Uh, the context, false teaching Jewish Judaizers, teachers, were going up to these Galatian churches after Paul had left. And they were poisoning the mind, the minds of these young believers in Galatia, saying that you, Jesus is not enough. You have to be circumcised, follow the, you know, all the, the traditions of Moses, convert and become a Jew, and then trust in Jesus in order to be saved. Paul says, no. Neither circumcision or uncircumcision is anything but a new creation. In other words, being regenerated by the Holy Spirit not outward acts to try to be saved. It's an inward regeneration by the Holy Spirit. And Paul says in verse 16, those 
who will walk by this rule, meaning trusting in grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone for salvation. Paul says, peace and mercy be upon these people, upon the Israel of God. Interesting. Who's Paul writing to here? The churches in Galatia. Is he calling them the Israel of God? Huh. That's interesting. Now, there are those, dispensations will say, oh, that's replacement theology, that the church replaces Israel. That's not biblical. Well, wait a second. We won't get into that today, but what is Scripture saying here? Paul's writing to the churches in Galatia, and he's saying, peace and mercy to you, the Israel of God. In fact, just go to 1 Peter, in chapter 2, this is interesting also. <laughs> well, Peter, a Jew, right, one of the apostles, talking to Christians, which would be uh, Jews who were scattered. Obviously, there would be, you know, Gentiles as well. He's talking, this is after Pentecost, so this would be the church age, according to the dispensationalists. And look what Peter says to Christians in the church age. Verses 9 and 10, he says, you're a chosen race. Isn't that what God said to Israel in the Old Testament? Look what Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying about the church. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's interesting. Again, in the church age, as dispensations would say, after Pentecost, Paul says, you're all one in Christ Jesus. Peter is quoting Old Testament scripture that God had said through Moses about the nation of Israel. Peter's quoting this and saying it's about Christians. And then let's go to Revelation and we'll go back to 1 Thessalonians and conclude. Revelation chapter 21, picture of heaven, and it's interesting. Verse 12 at the end, well, let's just read it. It had a great high wall, 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names were written on these gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Good. He describes more about the gates. Verse 13, three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. Now watch this. Verse 14, and the wall on the city had 12 foundational stones. So you have the gates, 12 tribes of Israel. Now you got a wall here, right? The wall on the city had 12 foundational stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we see gates, Israel, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wall, apostles, church age. Doesn't look like they're separated, right? And so, what's the point? <laughs> okay. Some of your heads are probably spinning. I'm just trying to spoon feed you on this right now. Those who believe that God works with Israel and the church separately during different dispensations, will say that the church will not experience the great seven-year tribulation that they say they find in Daniel 9 and also Daniel 12. They say when Christ comes back, he's not going to touch his feet on the ground, he's going to be in the air, and he's going to raise up all those who died in Christ during the church age. They'll be resurrected up to him, right? They say... They say, we who are still alive during the church age will then be taken out and then the seven-year tribulation will begin. It'll end 
Christ's second coming, he sets up his millennial rule. Dispensationalism. Covenant theology says no. Between the first and second coming of Christ, it's one dispensation. Christ is gathering by his spirit his one flock, Jews and Gentiles, right? And unfortunately, the church will go through tribulation. In fact, the closer we get to the second coming of Christ, the greater the tribulation. But we don't have to worry. Because when Christ comes back, they say that is his only coming back, his only second coming. He is going to judge Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. He is going to rapture his people home and bring in the eternal state. So, even though we, as covenant theologians say, will go through tribulation, don't worry. Christ is coming back for us. And so, as I conclude 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read, verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who fall asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Dispensationalists say those who have fallen asleep in Jesus whose souls return with Christ here, those are people who died during the church age. Covenant theologians say the souls that come back with Christ are all souls that died. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, right? Israel, the church, right? Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Dispensationalists say the dead in Christ referring to souls of, or the, the, uh, those who died during the church age. Covenant theologians say the dead in Christ talks about all believers. Okay? Verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Dispensationalists say this is the rapture of the church. Okay? prior to the seven-year Great Tribulation and then the thousand-year millennial reign. Covenant theologians say this is the rapture of the church, but this is a Christ's second coming. Um, and if we're still alive when Christ comes back, they say, well, that, well again, covenant theologians say, because we're going through tribulation. But don't worry, Christ is going to take us out and then usher in the eternal state. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. Now, as I conclude, let me just say, I'm trying my best to just show you these two different views. And I'm trying to show you scripture on both sides so you start to get an understanding. Now, let me be abundantly clear. Um, there are many phenomenal theologians who hold to the dispensational view. There are many phenomenal theologians who hold to the covenantal view. Many of these theologians I study. I, they're brothers in Christ. I honor them. There's a different view regarding end times. But that doesn't make this guy's heretics. If one disagrees with the other, not necessarily, right? We're just trying to interpret Scripture the best we can in the power of the Spirit to understand the best we can, right? So, wherever you land on this at this point, and again, we'll talk more about this next week, don't, look, this should not divide the church, not the true church, right? Here's the bottom line. Verse 18, we should comfort one another with these words. Here's what we do know. Whether, <laughs> you know, uh, 
there's a seven year tribulation or no, we're just in the tribulation period, whether there's a literal, you know, thousand year millennial reign of Christ in Jerusalem, or if it's just a symbolic spiritual reign on the hearts of, of, of believers. Look, we want to be diligent in studying the scriptures and trying to understand what God meant by what God said in this text. But this text doesn't give us all the details, right? Paul's not here trying to make primarily a doctrinal point on the rapture. There are other texts that you can kind of add to these. 1 Corinthians 15, dispensations use John 14. Um, there are other texts that can be used to kind of start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. But even with that, there are still some pieces that you kind of go, ah, oh, they can go either way. What we want to focus on is this. Christ is coming back for his people. Those who have died in the Lord and those who are still alive at the coming of the Lord. And here's what we know. There's going to be a glorious reunion all of God's people worshiping the Lord throughout eternity. That's what we want to comfort each other with. The exact details and order, again, <laughs> we'll do our best over the next few weeks to try to dissect this as much as we can, but guys, let's not lose focus on the main point of what Paul's doing here. In these verses, Paul is being doctrinal, but he's also being pastoral. Real people died, and real people were grieving over the death of their loved ones. They had real questions, real concerns, and maybe they were a bit confused. And here in this text, Paul is being pastoral because he was dealing with real life people in real life situations. Just like I had to do for my mother and my wife and other people when we had that memorial service for my father 10 years ago. Because we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we know Christ is coming back for his people. Jews and Gentiles, right? And we know that throughout eternity we will be worshiping our risen King and Savior. We know throughout eternity there will be no sin, no suffering, no death, no sorrow. For the old things have passed and the new has come. And we want to thank our Lord for that certainty. Because all of us are going to probably, while we're alive here on earth, all of us are going to probably have to stand in front of the casket of the, that's holding one of our loved ones. And to know that they died in the Lord, whew, the comfort that provides. That's why we want to be busy talking to our loved ones about the Lord, right? And I have to tell you, to, to stand in front of the casket of a, of a loved one who died and, and to look at that shell of their body and go, that's not them. I know where his or her soul is. And I know that he or she's going to get a new glorified body. Man, that is such 
comfort and it provides such incredible healing during the most difficult of times Paul's being pastoral here and again that's why he said therefore let us comfort one another with these words we'll look at the different views we'll study them we'll try to be humble in our interpretation of these different views we will seek the illumination of the Holy Spirit to help us understand more and more, but never lose sight of the fact that the true comfort is knowing that, Christian, your Lord is coming for you one day, and you will be with Him forever. Amen.